Hello, hello everyone. My name is Dimitar and I am a DeFi technical project lead, independent contractor with UIDX Foundation, our host on this talk and also supporter of Nebula. And I'll be more than happy to help you introduce yourself to UIDX V4. I'll tell you more what V4 is. I'll tell you more what our testnet is in just a second. But before we start, really important slide. This is not a financial advice. Do your own research, all the good stuff. See, I had a really nice conversation yesterday with a gentleman. We identified that in our space, we kind of have three focuses. One is technical, of course. We must discuss block space, we must discuss consensus. The other is purely philosophical, decentralization, building the future, being fair. And the third one is, of course, money, DGN stuff. Now, this is no DGN stuff. A little bit of philosophical stuff, a lot of technical stuff, no DGN. So make sure that you click on I agree over there. What are we going to cover today? Um, we'll start with un petit entrée, with some history about V4, with some data on why we are coming to V4, what's happening here. We'll also have some high-level overview on the system, on components, on architecture. Then I'll deep dive into testnet and what exactly you can do right now with it. There's more things coming our way. I will point you to where to look at for more information as things progress in the future. So hopefully, we can see each other in Discord and most important, in GitHub log, all right? Let's get to it. Oh, and for dessert, we have some questions and some a small surprise. Let's get to some deep dive on the history of V4 and how we became what we became right now. So we got a testnet, right? So why, what are we testing? V4, or DYDX, started on Ethereum as many, many good things. Mm, 2017, perps trading, smart contracts, gas was cheap, life was good for a while, then not so much. So uh, we had several products there, or I think two products there running. At one point, as many products do, they go on layer two. DYDX exchange went on StarkX from Starkware, where it actually performed and still performs pretty well. We got about $466 billion of volume last year. I can tell you that right now the daily volume is about a billion, so not so bad, right? And next we're going to Cosmos, so probably some of you are asking, why? You know, I got you covered. Why do we have V4? What are we do doing all these changes? Why? Why? What's happening? First and foremost, we need more decentralization in the space, right? Now that V3, the previous version, is centralized too much, there is a centralized component, as with many layer twos, and big part of this is the matching engine and the order book. With V4, we want to have them decentralized as well. Now, I'm just opening this. If we forget about that we have V4 on Cosmos, let's think about if we want to have a decentralized system, fully decentralized. What about if we want to have decentralized fee distribution? No one ent entity benefiting, but rather a community, right? Let's think about that for a second. What about if we want to scale our order throughput? You know, if V3 had pretty good, or has pretty good, good order throughput, but still, when we want to improve this, what do we do? Do we do our own layer two? What do we do, right? Well, if we want to keep the finality and fairness, of course, because that's really crucial and important. We want to have immediate finality. We want, uh, especially on trade outcomes. Um, what, what if we want to incentivize or align all incentives across the, the entire system, the entire protocol, and not only one entity benefiting from any part of it? And of course, it's a really, really, really hot topic right now, MEV. How about if we discourage or, or avoid harm, harmful form of MEV? On top of it, and final but not least, what if we wanted to upgrade 
incrementally and seamlessly, like adding new markets, like uh, introducing new um, new products on top of what we have already, and do that as a community. Uh, what, what if you want to have more improved, more advanced margin and, and collateral uh, options? That's why here we are, V4, moving to Cosmos. Pretty brave, I know. Many of you probably will ask at the end more questions to why this is happening. Go ahead, don't shy away. Right, so we have Cosmos coming. How does this look? We have an exchange that has central limit order book that has the dust prep training, per perpetual trading. How does it look from, this is more high level overview. I know that most of you would like to see some code that's coming our way soon. Let's have a look at the high level overview. Of course, on top of it, or some look at the bottom of it, we have the node itself. And the important about UIDX v4 is that the node is running two things. It's running in-memory order matching engine. All nodes are running one. And at the consensus level, we have final transactions happening. So the final order transaction, when a transaction, transaction gets matched, it goes to the state. Things would have been much easier if everything was on state, especially on the second component in the system, which is the indexer. So we, we see plenty of indexers that are just a service running with a database. In our case, and we have our friends for Imperator giving a talk on Tuesday about it, the indexers are, first of all, quite important, and second of all, much more complicated. Dylan will dive into that details more. Just, you know, um, some sneak peek. An indexer runs a set of services. It has two types of storage. One is Redis, which is in memory. The other is Postgres for more state-oriented stuff. It also has several AIPs running to provide um, data availability. And final but not least, it has its own full node. Very important for anyone who will try to do something with the API and with the um, clients and all the available things when things go open source, we should know what's the life cycle of transactions. First of all, they, as expected, originate at the clients or at the libraries. And they go to the full node or a validator. That full node will gossip those transactions to its peers, and transactions will enter the order book signed by the uh, user. Once they get matched, they, of course, get picked up by the indexers and become available for the front ends. Has anyone tried testnet so far? Did you notice something with the testnet so far? Okay, we'll see at the end. All right, all right, yeah. <laughs> You'll get a chance to ask or, or raise a hand. Um, yeah, so yeah, indexers pick transactions. Um, they provide them to the front end. They provide them to the APIs. The APIs display them on the screen for the testnet, for example, for the web front end. And everything's, everyone's happy. This flow is going to be like for mainnet as well, obviously. Some more, I'd like to show you some more information about governance and what's happening in that, that regard. Things are, um, on the surface, pretty simple. Uh, UIDX v4 is using XGov module. It is not uh, utilizing OZ at the moment. It's not utilizing evidence, free grant, mint, NFT circuit, or genital. Utilizing um, XGov to build the flexibility needed for now for, for stakers to actually vote and to participate in governance. What can stakers do? Submit transactions, uh, submit proposals vote on proposals, and the standard XGov stuff like inherit the vote of their validator if they don't participate or override the vote. Aside from the standard XGov parameters or standard SDK parameters, we also have a set of UIDX specific parameters. For example, and this is not an ex extensive, exhaustive list, we can add, adjust, modify, delete markets, we can control the set of third-party um, Oracle price sources. We can adjust the trading and gas fees. 
how we can adjust the, the rewards mechanisms, and so on and so forth. I'll provide some more information later down the line on where you can look on the list of things we can adjust and update. But that's pretty much the gist of it. We have the standard text of spam prevention mechanism, which is using the minimal deposits parameter. Basically, whoever is proposing a change should take care of um, putting enough deposit value in it so that it becomes live. And, well, actually, anyone can be contributing to a deposit for a proposal. How does voting go? We have the basic operations, voting yes or voting no. We have a no with veto, which we'll cover in a second. And we have abstain, which is a really good one because you are acknowledging the vote itself. You're not participating actively in it. So you're still active participant in the community, not on this proposal in particular. Now, something more about um, the, the uh, vetoing. Well, if enough vetoers, which is one third, veto the vote, you actually lose your deposit. In all other cases, you are able to withdraw it or ref to get refunded. Pretty standard stuff, pretty robust stuff, we know. That's good stuff. Where we are right now with all these amazing things, Dev test, Dev test net is way behind us. It was something internal. It was something that the core team did some time ago. Internal test net also happened some time ago. We went out of private test net into public test net about three weeks ago. And we are here for the public test net. That's the main player right now. We'll cover some things about the public test net. Um, you're more than welcome to pick up your phones. We'll have some QR codes for you to actually scan and try stuff out. Beginning with how to connect and what's where, moving into some more information about the API clients, and finishing with, well, it's a test net, so we should be able to troubleshoot. Before we begin with the how to connect, the current state of the test net, we have pretty big names as participants. We have Node Guardians, Stake Lab, Informal, Galaxy, Chorus One, and yeah, you can see pretty much everyone here, good names. Um, some statistics from yesterday, uh, you're free to prove me wrong on them for today, it's fine. We had a pretty solid block time, quite a lot of transactions happening already, and pretty, pretty good state. So here's some more information on what exactly to expect right now on testnet, what set of features. I can give you the preliminary information. It's basic trading functionality. Um, it is, yeah, you can scan the link. Uh, this, is not, uh, this is a list that's going to be probably updated soon with more, more stuff coming our way. And this is something like a, your way to actually feel how the state is right now with functionality. Very important link. This is the web application client, the web client. Pretty easy to use. There's a faucet in there. Just connect your MetaMask. Get wrecked. It's free. It's fun. And I do recommend it. It's free money. And you can actually experiment with shorting stuff leverage. We already have a iOS test light app. You can try that one out. You can ask me later for the Android version. Now we have this ready. Again, pretty easy to use. No hustle. Here's where all the repositories are going to be initially made available public. This location will probably change over time. However, do pin it up. It's coming our way. I'm not sure when exactly, but it's coming our way. This is the good stuff happening. I want to give you now some more details about the APIs themselves. First of all, well, on this link, you'll see a link for the indexer that's currently running. This will be changing over time, probably, as we progress with the testnet. Have in mind that you should check this page every now and then. V3 APIs, or rather V4 API, is 
kind of very much inspired by V3, but V3 is living on you know, Ethereum and StarkX, so we cannot have the same thing on Cosmos. For example, the authentication mechanism on StarkX is, is quite different. We have the Ethereum key going to StarkX key going to an API key. With V4, we have a simple signing mechanism for how we participate and how we sign transactions. There's an Easter egg here. You can have a look at what's happening right now with the um, block height. Hint, it's not the same. You can try to figure out where I went wrong. But yeah, this is something you can use to ping the indexer and see what's the current state. Pretty easy, pretty convenient API with the indexer. Nothing too, too tough here. Some more information on, on the testnet itself, like the Genesis JSON, the seed nodes, the validator URL. There's a link to a networks repository here in this page that's going to come our way um, hopefully soon as the repositories become public. So something to keep an eye on as well. And let's dive into the API clients, okay? The goal is to have in the beginning um, what, what trading is going or the core team is going to provide is two sets of clients. One is, of course, Python for those that are prone to writing bots, and the other is TypeScript. For example, the front end is utilizing the TypeScript script client. Pretty robust way to download and install. Now it's not available, it's going our way, don't worry about it. And these libraries or these two packages provide us with a set of, of clients we can utilize for whatever we want. First of all, it's the indexer client. As I mentioned, the indexer API is separate from the evaluator API, and this is something that's quite different between V3 and V4. So we have a separate set of um, ways to fetch data from the indexer. For example, fetching the, the block height from the command line before that happens pretty easily, as you can see. We just need the indexer configuration file or indexer configuration JSON to instantiate the client and just call the function. That's it. We also, well, the indexer also provides a, a WebSocket API for more subscription-based data fetching. For example, candles or subscribing to candle updates. Again, as easy as the previous one, we just need several callbacks to handle the callbacks, uh, to handle the incoming data. The validator client, the one that's used for many things, including for posting transactions, I've deliberately not given an example for posting transactions because we have a better way to do this. The validator client has a separate API, set up, set up, separate set of um, of clients for it, separate configuration uh, per object. Again, easy to instantiate, easy to use. And finally, the good stuff, which is the composite client, which provides us with a more easy, human, um, readable way to actually post transactions and do all the other stuff as well. So I would actually prefer to use this one if I were you for all the things it provides. Some more information about how we can actually debug or how we can um, make sense if something's wrong with the testnet because this is a testnet after all. So it is supposed to break it. We are supposed to have outages on it. We already had several. Again, we want to have outages on testnet, not on mainnet. So this is the time we actually observe this. So if you decide to try out any of the things I showed before that and see it's not working, first thing to do, status page. It will show you if you're right now in an uptime position or if something's wrong with the indexer, with some of the validators, with the network overall. It also provides information about historical uptime and it has some incident log as well to see what has been happening with the testnet. Right now, I think the, the uptime is above 95%. Still, we had some issues, right? And it's normal. Standard stuff, the min scan, the block, block explorer, pretty easy to use. We all in Cosmos know how to handle this one. We all know what to find there. Average block time, for example. I'm not sure what it is right now, but anyone can check. And the Kepler dashboard for, in addition to what the other one show, governance proposals. 
some preliminary dates about what's happening with testnet. Those are subject to change, uh, to have it in mind, but we expect several network resets, resets as we go. That's completely normal. The last one is not yet defined. It's probably coming as mainnet progresses. So yeah, um, if you find your testnet stuff gone, that's OK. Don't worry about it. We also envision or anticipate several network upgrades quite close by, but we, we or the, the core team will want to join or to add more stuff to the testnet as we progress. So we'll see some upgrades as we go, some hard, hard forks. Very important link. This is where feedback happens. It's a Google Forms form. I do welcome you to participate and to provide anything you notice as the best way to actually improve a product. And some more information about the ecosystem you can find on the ecosystem report. It's quite visual, quite beautiful. You can actually get a sense on who's participant in, in, in our ecosystem and to, to get a sense on what's going on in the big picture. We, I'm guessing we'll have one of these each year. How to participate? Well, top to bottom, first one is our is DYDX Foundation's Twitter handle, where you get most of the information, most of the updates. You can be really um, feel up to date all the time following this Twitter handle. Second is the community dashboard, information about staking, information about your participation currently for V4 or V3. The DYDX forum is where the discussions in the community happen. I've also posted some, some information gathering uh, wiki-like posts there, so it's a good source of information as well. We have a robust DAO setup. You should also be checking this one. We have a big DAO, uh, core DAO. We have a setup of sub-DAOs. For example, the op sub-DAO is responsible for running some of the, um, accountable for running some of the components. And finally, we have the DYDX Foundation uh, website. I do encourage you to, to join Dylan's talk on Tuesday, and also do encourage you highly to test and to try out the YDX Exchange v4, and so yeah, find bugs and just have fun. Finally, you can grab your cred here and ask questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>